Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, joining us online today. Um, I just want to welcome you all um, for our sixth and final week of the Black and Free New Art Series, which invited a group of talented artists to examine themes of Blackness and freedom through an artistic lens and showcase their work at the museum and online. It's been a very wonderful and engaging series, and we want to thank everyone who has come out in person, watched online, and given their support for this project. If you're interested in any of the previous artist dialogues, um, they're available to watch on our YouTube channel at the Museum TV. The Museum and Black and Free have a multi-year partnership, and we will have more programming in the future, so please make sure to keep up to date with us and the Black and Free project. Um, so thank you all so much again for your support, and without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Naila Kalida May. Thank you very much, Rachel. Feels so nice to be here with you, so nice. We have gathered around the fire again, so nice. Hearts open to feel and heal, so nice. We are alive. So nice, so nice, so nice. Such an honor to share this space with you. Ask the spirits to guide us the whole way through. May our past and futures collide in this place. Carry us all in a warm embrace. Feels so nice to be here with you, so nice. We have gathered around the fire again, so nice. Hearts open to feel and heal, so nice. We are alive, so nice, so nice, so nice, so nice. Thank you so much for coming this evening. Welcome to Black and Free. We begin today by acknowledging that we are meeting on Aboriginal land that has been inhabited by Indigenous peoples from the beginning. In particular, we acknowledge the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. We are grateful to the Indigenous peoples who have been and are caretakers of this land. I understand Black liberation to be deeply intertwined with indigenous resurgence. So now I'm going to sing in call and response. And so wherever you are, synchronous or asynchronous, I invite you to sing along and to sing in response. Black and free. Black and free. Black and free, black and free, black and free, black and free. Black and free, black and free, my name is Dr. Nayula Kalita May and I am the Principal Investigator of Black and Free, Canada Research Chair in Race, Gender and Performance, Associate Professor at the University of Waterloo and a multidisciplinary artist. I started Black and Free in 2017 and it has grown into an artistic and academic experience that deepens, enlivens, and expresses themes of Blackness and freedom, projecting expansive visions of what that could be for engaged, curious, and casual members of the public. Black and Free Research Creation Project brings together artists, academics, students, and the following organizations 
Citizen Brand, Ken Sealing Waterloo Region Museum, NOR, the Design Commons for Canada, Studio Otherness, The Edge, The Museum, Wilfrid Laurier University Press, and Young People's Theatre. Together, we are examining Blackness and freedom through research and art with support from an Ontario Research Fund Research Excellence Grant. This new weekly series called Black and Free New Art is concluding today, um, as Rachel said, after six weeks um, in February and in March. And Black and Free New Art has been presented in partnership with the museum. I would like to say thank you to the museum for hosting us online today and in person for um, the last five sessions. Uh, I chose, uh, we chose to produce this series in this way and with the museum because we wanted um, to be able to think about art and to think and talk and be with Black artists. Um, the series has featured artists Beck Duress, Ken Daly, Miss Coco Murray, Simone Patricia, Sarita Wignall, and today Tapui, who is presenting to us, um, for us, with Joel Dirksen of Studio Otherness. These artists have been commissioned to create original work in the medium of their choice on the topic of Blackness and freedom. Each artist's work tells a unique story that explores the multifaceted experiences of Blackness and freedom through historic and contemporary lenses. And so without further ado, I would like to pass you over to the very capable hands of um, the Black and Free, one of our Black and Free research assistants, uh, Jaleesa Ricketts, who will introduce herself, as well as um, our first guest. So hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being with us here today on our final Black and Free um, event for the year. Um, it's been such a great ride and I'd like to also extend my thanks to the museum as well um, for all of their great help and support throughout this journey. It's been incredible. Um, so my name is Julissa Ricketts. I'm a PhD student at York University studying social and political thought. I'm also a filmmaker who looks at Black geographies, cultural geographies, architecture, and water. I'm very happy to introduce our first guest, um, Joel. So Joel is originally from Canada and his design practice is filmed with, filled with complex and nuanced visual solutions for clients who demand sensitivity, insight, and communicable differences in the market. Startups, scale-ups, and established brands benefit from his no stones unturned approach to problem solving and his appreciation um, that complex situations bring forward unique perspectives. Before founding Studio Otherness, Joel's focus was on executing brand strategy, um, which led him to consult on um, refreshes and reimaginings for companies such as Bosch, um, ING and Salomon. Um, I hope I pronounced at least some of those correctly, Joel. Um, he pre previously worked on um, consulting and agencies um, such as IDEO and Huge and Landor. Joel is a consistent presence in the international design scene, supporting over 60 international publications, awards, and features in his decade of work. So thank you so much, Joel, for being here. Thanks so much for having me. Where should we begin? Well, can I jump in here too for some context? Yes. So I will join. Um, Thank you. So Nahila here, <laughs> I, the context I would like to offer now is that Joel and Studio Otherness is a, pro a project partner of Black and Free. So one of the eight um, project partners uh, that I mentioned earlier. And so how we came to be with the thinking about typeface design is through this partnership. Um, and so Joel and I began having conversations in January of 2022. Um, at which point uh, Joel suggested, made a great suggestion um, that changed the course of things for Black and Free. And that suggestion, Joel, was, I'll pass it to you. Make a typeface. <laughs> so, 
Um, as a little bit of history, um, with all the work that I do, um, my focus and the studio's practices around brand design. And um, brand design is uh, this, uh, say, tool in graphic communications and visual communications of taking a philosophy, uh, changing into a visual expression and saying, okay, here's a system or a structure or a scaffolding uh, upon which a brand can grow. So um, when we looked at the work around Black and Free and listened to the philosophies and saw all the research and everything that had come out of it, um, what became very apparent is the importance of language and the use of language, and then understanding typography as a machine of language, a language made visible. Um, but then on the other side of it saying, well, it is just shapes on a page. It can also be an artistic expression as much as abstract art can be, as much as any act of mark making can be. So um, when we think about language and the power of language, uh, the way that language both limits us and frames us um, and can also be used and leveraged in different ways, it became very obvious that words were a powerful part of branding this experience. And so Joel said typeface. <laughs> and then that in that process, we were meeting weekly for months. Um, and I was learning so much and being guided through this process. Um, and one of the things that came out of it and that some of you may already know about is a call um, uh, for a typeface designer um, that uh, Joel put together. And um, part of our conversations and gathering of, of material led to a mood board. Um, that became a central piece of that call for a typeface designer. Yes, exactly. So in trying to express um, uh, both uh, the spirit and what we wanted to capture, but also to equip anybody who's coming onto the project for success, we thought to work together and create effectively a collage, which I will share with you now, um, that we would call a mood board. So hopefully you can see my screen here. Um, Naila, can you see my screen? Jalisa, can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Perfect. So um, a lot of our discussion came around uh, often these thematic dichotomies um, of things like modularity and ease of development. Um, we didn't know who our project partner would be. Typeface is a very kind of, uh, mystical art in a certain way. It has a lot of nuances. It has a lot of ins and outs. It's also very much an institution. Um, so part of our process was talking about how can we be the most liberated in a very, uh, say, strict uh, discipline. Um, so what you see on the screen, for example, is these themes of modularity or these kind of very raw graphic forms. Uh, and these approaches to type design let someone both comprehend the words, but give us the maximum amount of, uh, say, room to express ourselves, um, as well as some technical and construction pieces. Um, another part of the mood board that you're seeing is uh, historical references um, to things like, obviously, uh, the civil rights movement, or even to more recent history, things like Afrofest. All of them uh, draw on a visual vernacular of protest. Um, and that has been, say, co-opted and subverted in a capitalist way, but there's still very much a historical truth uh, to them and, and their energy. So uh, bringing these two worlds together, we thought, gave us both uh, room to uh, be free of an institution of typography and to express, um, to consider the historical uh, language of protest, um, and then also to uh, imagine future spaces, again, by uh, giving us the most uh, wiggle room by purely uh, expressing in graphic forms or in what we would call modular uh, pieces. Some of you may recognize some of these images as well, like some of these images of um, Afropunk in particular come from a site visit that I did to Afropunk in 2019. Um, some of the, um, and so it just came through these weekly conversations that, that Joel and I were having. Um, 
that this emerged from. Yeah, as well. Exactly. So maybe we can talk a bit about how, um, 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 so this then uh, became a call that was circulated um, for a typeface designer uh, that would work in collaboration with Studio Ebonist um, uh, as a project partner because the actual scope of doing typeface, uh, a type, an entire typeface would be um, tremendous and exceeded because it was it exceeded the kind of scope of the project. And so um, when it was originally conceived of, and so the Part of what emerged was this collaboration between Studio Ebonist um, and uh, a typeface designer who, through a process of application, um, led us to and who found us. I'm so grateful that they found us, that she found us, was is Tafui, um, whose work we're excited to discuss today. Um, Joel, is there anything else I think that, that we should add here? Um. I would say just as a small cul-de-sac into branding, mm -hmm. one of the main considerations on getting to a typeface um, as a, a piece of design is that um, the Black and Free project is extending across so many media and uh, in so many places and across such a long time duration that a typeface became also the best way to um, ensure that the look became say iconic or recognizable over time as it transitioned through so many mediums and maybe across so many project partners um mm -hmm. and so that's one piece and the second one is that this is a very new type of approach for work in canada and i would say it's quite you know like exciting and and quite bold in that way um canada does not have a strong typographic history and it is a conservative history, let's say. Um, so this is a very fresh approach and it's quite um, innovative, I would say, on what we're, what we're achieving here. So without further ado, um, onwards. <laughs> <laughs> so we will pass to Jalisa once again, please, um, to introduce us to Tafui. Thank you so much. That was incredible. Um, it was really nice seeing all the different aspects that come together to create a typeface. Um, so I'm very happy to introduce our artist today, Tafui. Um, Tafui is an educator, designer, and painter. Her paintings are inspired by deconstructing cultures into their base elements and symbols, looking for similarities and relationships that they share. She currently produces um, environmentally responsible home products and licenses her work to clients. Her work is inspired by her love of indigenous cultures, modern design, and traditional textile techniques that adds a unique aesthetic to the modern retail experience. Her diverse body of work includes art prints, wallpapers, textile, tableware, and stationery. Welcome, Tafui. Hi, thanks for having me. Oh, you're, you're muted. Okay. Yeah, so you have um, a presentation for us today. You were going to show us some of your, um, some of your artwork and what you've been working on so far with the typeface. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, so, so um, this this is basically um, a sketch. It's a digital. It's a digital sketch of what I've been working on after speaking with Joel and Naila um, and going through that amazing mood board. Um, I started to really think about all of these different approaches and answers and questions to um, this project and also seeing the similarities in what I do as an artist too, because I, my work is about deconstructing, in deconstructing cultures. And they had a particular call within the mood board about including tapestry and textiles. And I really wanted to um, introduce that into this project because it's also something that I personally am passionate about. And, you know, us as a people, you know, at our core, when you look at pre-colonial indigenous cultures, 
you see this very um, deep, um, well thought out and well integrated use of symbolism as a means of communication. So this predates typography and 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 you know words as we know it today. And we still use it as graphic designers, which is also a part of my practice. And that's why you know you can go to France and you can see a stop sign and you'll know that you're supposed to stop even though you might not know what the word mean but you know it's a stop sign so symbols are very important to us as humans and it's a very um that I, for me i think it's the best way um to communicate amongst different cultures so i really wanted to introduce the concept of symbolism within this project because i thought it would be so uh, relevant um, to what we're working on. So we can go to the next slide. Um, so as someone, um, you know, who was born in, in Jamaica um, and consider myself to be a part of the, well, I am a part of the Black people of the Americas and the relationship between, um, you know, um, or indigenous cultures that we are no longer may, we may no longer think that we're directly connected to, but it somehow creeps into our psyche and our music and our way of expressing. I wanted to include um, some um, uh, pre-colonial or very identifiable symbols that um, belong to cultures that we are also tied to. And um, I started to really think about, um, you know, like uh, the textiles, you know, it was also part of the call from Joel and Naila, and they had this beautiful piece of kente cloth within um, the mood board, and it caught my eye immediately. And I was really excited that they included that because, you know, it's, it, it, um, such an instrumental part of this project and for me I think a lot of the symbols when I when you look throughout the continent some of them are actually repeated within different cultures if you look at the bottom right hand corner here in this slide you also have some of these imageries within beading like within southern African cultures and eastern African cultures so I thought it was really great to include these symbols um, not only for their imagery, but the meaning that they also have within textiles. Um, and many um, pre-colonial textiles, not just even within Africa, but throughout indigenous cultures, pre-colonial indigenous cultures, they have a deep meaning. And I wanted to deconstruct the Kente cloth. Uh, for me, it's, it's such an iconic African textiles almost everyone knows what it looks like and has um, had some kind of visual interaction with it. And I wanted to use that as the base for the typeface. So I went through and chose some of the symbols that to me were um, very powerful, not just for the meaning, but also um, image wise. So we can just go to the next slide. So pulling from the kente cloth and these symbols and imageries from the kente cloth, I took these um, symbols and really started to rotate them and to play with them to see how it could work with um, the negative and the positive space. The, 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 the textiles that I normally work from personally is uh, Bogaland Fini and it works with a negative space. So you create, you use a negative space to create the positive image. So I wanted to really um, work with that kind of concept to, to just use different types of um, methods in creating um, an imagery and um, bringing it together. So I started to really play with these imageries here and to think what, what could I create or what would, what would come out of, um, working with these symbols if we worked with them sometimes in the positive and sometimes in the negative space and to see what that would look like. So with the next slide. Um, so and then this was just the 
the investigation of what that would look like, what would an O look like, what would a zero look like, and also with creating a typeface, um, there's so many different things that you have to think about, and how will this reduce? So even still, you know, as I'm working on it, it still has room for a lot of editing. But I really wanted to start from um, this process of the negative and the positive space and the use of symbolism integrated within um, this modern um, tool that we call typography or a typeface now. And then what would that look like? And then when you start looking at the imagery, what's more important now? Does the type become like, is the O more important than the symbol within that O? And, and um, you know, just really playing with the negative and the positive space to see what that actually, what new image and what new shape does that create? And then we can go to the next slide. And then this is now working with um, those symbols as the positive in the in the um, uh, the positive um, symbol. So the left one say would be an I, and the middle one is a T. And because the M and a W are similar, this is the beginning stage of what would the M and the W um, look like in this using it this symbol as the launching pad for the typeface and we can go to the next one and it's the same investigation with the p and the q and um the weight if we're going to be doing a bold versus a thin weight and so it's there was a lot of science behind creating a typeface and, and, and um, you know, if I reduce it to like um, a five point, what would that look like? Is it still going to be effective? And what are the, the what am I going to be reducing or removing or um, reconstructing when we, we um, have it in such a small scale? Are we going to be thinking about the scale? You know, now that we are in a so-called post um, PC world uh, where we can now pinch on a, an imagery to make it larger if it's not um, uh, as legible for us, do we now think about reduce, how, how does something reduce and are we going to be printing it and what size is it going to be printed at? And what's the most important thing? Is it the symbol that's important or is it the letter that's going to be now important? So these are some of the questions that you know I would ask myself as I'm going through this process of creating a new um, um, typeface for um, um, for this project, and if we can go through. Oh, and then that's it for now. So this is just a look at at the process of what goes into um, creating a type. Normally it takes a decade to actually make this typeface um, or if the typefaces that we use now on a daily basis and we don't think about and um, you know so it was just um, it's really a wonderful investigation into um, this project and and you know bringing these two worlds together in a different way when you think everything has already been done, how do you create something new in this space? And I find it's like very exciting to be thinking about putting all of these cultures together um, because type culture is, um, is also another thing that you have to be thinking about too when you're creating um, a product like this. So <laughs> that's it. That was incredible. Thank you so much. And I'm so excited to see what the final product is because what you have already is phenomenal. So thank you. Thank you. Mm. So if you don't mind, I have a few questions for you. Sure. Um, so the first question that I had was sort of, what was the very starting point of creating this typeface for you? Like how do you- I think Joel should like hop in with this too. If we could just 
um, let Joel hop in with this because it was really, um, um, it, 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 his mood board was really the launching pad for, um, for this direction too. So I think it would be great to, for him to like speak on this also. Sure. Mm, yeah. If you don't mind. Yeah. yeah. Um, so really a lot of like why a typeface and why now um, came from one technical is actually a technical insight, um, which is that, um, as I mentioned earlier, the duration of the project uh, means that so many people might need like, you know, you make a logo, you pick some colors, you pick all these things, which we all maybe know as a brand, right? We have the Nike swoosh, they have certain colors, things like this. Um, but what is increasingly uh, becoming common, especially in longer projects, is to actually commission typefaces, which is more common over in Europe these days. Um, so McDonald's has their own font. Um, you know, the bank has their own custom font, things like this. And it's um, what it does is that it ensures that a certain essence or atmosphere, uh, regardless of who is making something, is transferred through. So that's part one, is that it actually in an odd way, typographic software can democratize kind of a brand or a brand experience. Um, because if you can install the typeface, then you type the letters and all of a sudden you've made a thing. Um, so a lot of the, that was almost like a technical lens to view the project through. How can we equip all of our project partners across multiple years with my involvement or not uh, for success? Um, that they shouldn't have to call me or a designer every time they want to make something. It should be a little more democratic than that. And that felt right with the spirit of what Naya was wanting to accomplish in her project. Um, the second layer of it is that we can absolutely release this typeface under a Creative Commons uh, type of space, depending on uh, if Tefu is in agreement with it. What that means is that uh, this typeface could be available for download, could be available for free for the public to use in a gesture of solidarity and connection. So again, a conceptual mark there. Um, and the third one, which I gestured to at the beginning, is that um, language frames and limits our perspectives. It's, it's a machine of an institution, right? Um, so what better way to change the limitations of that than by changing the machinery itself? Um, and what does that empower and what does that unlock for us? Um, so those are really the earliest jumping off points of why a typeface works. Um, and of course, Nagula's work in written word and spoken word and poetry, words just mean so much. So they, they must be made significant. So that's where it started. Um, then we made a mood board, had a lot of conversations, and over to Tafui. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and Tafui, you sort of mentioned that the tente was um, sort of what anchored your design. Um, so whenever you were looking at kente, what specifically drew you to the symbols that you chose? The, um, um... You know, I was introduced to Kente when I was a, a child. I actually went to school with someone by the name of Kente and he explained to me what it was. And then I had to find out what it looked like. Um, but in particular, these there has been certain different evolutions of, um, the tech, of the textiles over the years, but these are the traditional um, symbols and patterns to the traditional ones. And I really liked um, how dominant those symbols were within the patterns. And mm. I also thought it would be a great way to um, have it resemble something, but not be exactly like the pattern. And it's, a, it's about reducing it and about um, making it, it a bit more minimal um, than what we're accustomed to. You know, it would have been great to create like a pattern type of typeface, but then if with, like I said, with the science of how um, typefaces work, 
you know, at, it's not, it just wouldn't be legible at a five point. Um, so those are the things that, you know, I'm still investigating with, with what I'm doing now, but this is definitely the launching pad for the, the, the final product. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that it's also, it really speaks to a sort of diaspora as well, whenever we consider Blackness and what Black and Free means. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. With that said, uh, were there any other aspects of the typeface that you feel like communicate Blackness and freedom to you? Because I noticed a lot of um, mixture where there's, you know, in some of them there's jagged edges and then other parts there's more smooth curvature. Um, so I was wondering if that had any significance at all. So, you know, there's something also that I discovered when I moved to Canada, you know, um, a Black person from the Americas. We don't, uh, even within my family, we don't look alike. So there are, um, we're family, but we don't look necessarily like we're from the same family. And as, um, as I began to meet more people from the continent of Africa, I started to realize that people actually who are from specific regions or specific tribes have special markers, like they have a specific um, look and aesthetic that we no longer have as people of Black people of the Americas. Um, and often get, um, you know, um, people who think that I'm Ethiopian. And I thought it was just very interesting because I didn't realize that um, people who are from Ethiopia have a specific look. And, um, and that really made me interested to find out about the culture. And it's, you know, it's also a part of discovery that I wanted to include in the work as a means of communication and conversation um, about um, what Americas. Um, so there are a lot of little subtle um, principles or thought processes included within the project um, that relates. Um, to my experience, um, right? So that's that's a part of it. So normally, in a traditionally in a in a type of family, a type based family, like you, they all look the same. You can tell that they are they all belong to each other. And I, in a way, I wanted to kind of disrupt that thought process a little bit by by saying we can be family and we don't have to look alike to be family. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's so beautiful because sometimes blackness is flattened and it's looked at as if it's a monolith, um, but yeah. it really speaks to the diversity within blackness um, that you're really representing uh, with this typeface. So thank you. Um, sort of on the same line of things, um, your work previously um, prior to the typeface is sort of rooted in a sort of intersectionality. Like you mentioned your love of indigenous culture and mixing it with, you know, contemporary design practices. Um, so I was wondering how you brought this background to this project. Um, well, I think just the, the thought that we're doing a typeface or a font, um, it's very modern. It's you know it doesn't really exist um, without a, a computer, you know, and then to to look at all of these very old symbols that pr definitely predates you know so many different cultures and how does that how does how do I interrupt you know how do we interrupt this modern day and way of thinking with something this old and like bringing it into um, a new world and a new space and for us to look at symbolism and communication in a different way. Um, for me, it's, it's just the practice of, uh, I think because I'm not indigenous to Jamaica, you know, I was born there and we've, you know, we've been there for um, hundreds of years, but, but beyond that, um, that connection was um, 
interrupted. So I, you know, really wanted to um, include that within this project too. And, you know, just go back and look at, at you know, if we were um, still there, what would we be doing now? And as a designer, how would I evolve, uh, evolve that culture? And um, just include that in the, this space that we're living in now. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. That was a great answer. Oh, um, <laughs> and not, you know, it, it what you were talking about sort of made me think about hieroglyph, hier hieroglyphs. If I'm saying yeah. that correctly, I don't know why I can't pronounce anything today. <laughs> but um, <laughs> you're making me think about uh, Egyptian hieroglyphs. Or um, uh, last week, Naila were, and I were talking about uh, drawings on on the walls of, of caves um, and you know sort of what you and Joel are talking about is really um, sort of getting rooted into the way that we visualize communication um, and how important that is um, and I mean it's it's very evident in in the um, designs that you've made so far. Uh, I also was going to ask if um, there were any other forms of media that you drew inspiration from? I know we saw the mood board, but I was wondering if, um, you know, you were inspired by any music or film, sculpture, painting, anything like that? Well, the reality is, as, as, uh, as an artist, for me, like, everything I've seen or experienced, um, you know, it stays and like it comes out in very subconscious ways. So for me to say I haven't been inspired by music or a song or a poem, um, I can't really say that because I have been because every time you have this experience, you become a different person. Um, but with that said, um, you know, for me, it was more of, a thought process than more of inspired by a specific um, thing. It was more of, um, I really aligned with the mood board that, that they, they made. I thought it was the perfect direction to go in. And, mm -hmm. um, and I am very much inspired by um, pre-colonial indigenous work especially textiles and um, so I definitely wanted to include the essence of um, the use of symbolism um, within textiles in the work um, because like I said before symbols the imagery of that it really does stay with us and now you're talking about you know ancient Egyptian um, art and the, you know, if I say Nefertiti, you can just imagine, you can just see her silhouette immediately, right? But you can't really see how to spell her name, but somehow you can see what her image looks like. So this is a, what I wanted to include with a, a, a type. It's the imagery for you to remember and retain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, you sort of talked about the science of um, creating a typeface, which I thought was really interesting because I think those of us who aren't from a design background, we don't necessarily think about scale um, because of course it'll look one way whenever it's larger, but then once it's smaller, um, there may be some difficulty there. So I was sort of wondering if you had any challenges um, navigating that type of science that you were referring to earlier. Well, I'm still navigating it because I'm still working on it, uh, you know, because like I said, it's normally over a decade it, that, that it takes. So the reduction, the part of reducing it is something that I'm also thinking about too with um, creating the positive imagery when, you know, how I had the use of the negative space. So with the positive space is where I'm thinking about the reduction part of it when it, it gets mm -hmm. smaller. If I work with a negative space, like if it's an, oh, you may not see at a five point, you may not see the negative space until um, you increase it, which also like 
visually or as an artist too, I think would be interesting. So, so, you know, we were talking like when Joel and I were also like nerding out about the whole idea of breaking the rules. These are some of the rules and, you know, they're there for a reason. Um, but even if you didn't see that negative space at the five point scale, you're still going to know that it's an O or a zero, right? Mm -hmm. And then sometimes it's also working with the concept of um, seeing someone and thinking one way about them or thinking this is who they are and then actually getting to know them and then you realize that they are not who you thought they were, right? So we like bringing that concept into to type where at five point, I may look this way at a hundred point, I'm gonna look another way versus if you take Helvetica, which is seen as like the, the perfect typeface, um, it's the same. It's the same at five point and at, at, um, at 100 point. And there are these rules that were made and constructed for definite, like you can understand why some of those rules are there, but then, you know, playing with the departure of that and and also thinking that we're in this post PC world and, and um, the access that people have and, and how you can actually personalize everything, all your devices now. Um, maybe some of those rules aren't as, as important as it used to be, you know? Yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that there's so much fun in, in breaking the rules and that's how we've gotten so many iconic um, designs that we have today. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So speaking of negative and positive space, I noticed that a lot of your work um, outside of this project um, is monochromatic. And I was just curious what that um, is sort of rooted in. And is it is it also mm -hmm. a play on negative and positive space? Or do you just like the look of it? Because that's an OK it's, answer. Well. <laughs> that's also, that is also a part of it. Um, but, you know, I met this, this um, man who was colorblind years ago, like, and he's, I, he just, it just really blew my mind, you know, the things that he could and he couldn't see. And um, so that stuck with me. And then also there was this textile that I love called Bogolanthony or mud cloth. It's also monochromatic and a lot of pre-colonial, a lot of people don't really um, realize that too, but a lot of pre-colonial um, textiles are actually earth tones and aren't um, very colorful because they use the natural pigmentation that the pigments that they needed access to. All of the very colorful, um, like African, I should say in quotation, textiles that we now think is actually African came from Europe, including the dyes and the beads, because originally the beads were just made of bone, which is just one color. Um, and also living in, in Canada, like, um, you know, in Ottawa, I would often go up to um, the Gatineau Hills, and it was just in the middle of winter, that was just like, my favorite spot to go to, and it was just black and black and then the white from the, um, the snow. And so that palette just slowly, just really crept into, you know, my psyche and um, here we are, here we are today with the black white palette and I'm obsessed with it. And occasionally I'll add a little color, but like I, my, my perfect, you know, the perfect palette for me is black and white. It's beautiful. And Thank as a, you. you know, as a customer, it's also great to decorate with um, monochromatic <laughs> stuff. So thank yeah. you, I appreciate it. <laughs> um, earlier you mentioned Helvetica. Um, and I know in our private correspondence, you mentioned the constructing the Helvetica font and um, how it was considered this or is considered a perfect font. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on that a little. I also want to make sure that Joel's um, 
included in this part of the conversation because he has some very strong feelings about the helmet. <laughs> okay, come <laughs> through, Joel. <laughs> Spill the tea. Oh, geez. Oh, geez. <laughs> um, well, I mean, where to start with that font? Um, so this, this, this nefarious font had a film made about it, um, but it, it is absolutely considered the perfect font, but um, if you look at the origins of it, um, it is what's called a Swiss typeface. Um, it's incredibly minimal, things like this. Um, and uh, when we look at, uh, say, in a Canadian perspective, um, it, it comes from a modernist trajectory, like um, the Canada modern film, things like this. Um, and all that effectively is and was, was uh, colonizing, graphic colonization. Um, that the Swiss came up with this very beautiful method of, say, uh, building things on grids and sanitizing them. Um, and Helvetica is the, I think, uh, quintessential expression of that. Um, so you look at something like the CN Railroad, which had this kind of absolutely horrible kind of colonizing trajectory. It literally carved across the land um, and it was burdened, let's say, with the history of its old look, uh, a serif typeface, it reeked of the empire. Um, and then uh, isn't it so coincidental that we come in with these clean lines, and these minimalist things, and we strip it of all context and say, okay, here it is, here's the truth now. We're clean, we're modern, we're above reproach, we have no ethical engagement with anything, we are decontextualized. Um, and to me, that's what Helvetica is. <laughs> So um, <laughs> that's 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 the spicy font for the evening. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. See, I that. told you very strong opinions about Helvetica. Yes. <laughs> and the thing is, you know, like I was educated, like my design education was in Montreal, so it's like a very pro Helvetica, um, mm. um, yeah, institution, and just. I did go through my Helvetica obsession phase. I did, I have to admit it. And um, now, you know, you kind of grow tired of that and then you want something different. And I really wanted to also disrupt the idea of it being the symbol of perfection um, by also including a part of that that I'm deconstructing within the work. And um, so, th th I mean, there's parts of it that work that you can't deny that it works, but then there's parts of it that you can actually just throw out the door. So um, this is where, you know, the, the worlds, the two worlds are gonna meet it's with this type face. But I just yes. had to include um, Joel's humble opinion. For sure. <laughs> I'm curious to know what you all know, like what y'all think about Comic Sans. No, we're not even going to talk about, we're, we won't, we are not. We don't not, talk about Comic Sans. No. No, no thank you. It's good for uh, if you have a dyslexia concern. Um, it's been proven oh. to uh, be a little bit more. Yeah, ready. he's right. Okay. He I used to right. love Comic Sans when I was younger. Anytime I would write a paper in, in elementary school or middle school, I'd <laughs> but then I found well, out that it, it was a, right <laughs> it was it were, you know and in some cases it might be appropriate you know it's just um not in all cases right yeah for right. sure yeah um but what you were saying about the perfection and minimalism um that is placed onto Helvetica is really interesting and I think it's also um sort of speaks to what y'all have done with the black and free um uh typeface because you're clearly not you're breaking the rules in the sense that it's not that you know super rigid minimalist tight condensed you know type of font um and it's really beautiful it really looks like it really does just look like little artwork little symbolism um which is great and Helvetica fans may, you know, they ought to consider it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'll say. <laughs> um, but no, it's beautiful. And it also, like I said, it really does speak to um, 
to power and breaking the rules because we definitely are moving towards a a very minimalistic era where that's sort of becoming mm-hmm. a thing and everything like I noticed a lot of um, brands in high fashion are sort of just doing a clean sweep of um, their logos and changing it to sort of fit a sort of Helvetica type um, mm, aesthetic mm-hmm. yeah um, so I was also going to ask um, what keeps you sort of engaged and inspired in art in general hmm. um i think you know having projects like this it's like i find very inspiring because it's taking a new look at something that we are so um, accustomed to interacting with on a daily basis. So I find this project for me is inspiring. I really love the the, the process of digging and, and um, trying to make something um, different in a world where it's very difficult to make something different, you know? And w- what is that going to look like? I still, you know, you know, think, you know, about how um, I can make the everyday product or um, thought, someone's thought just a little different for today. Like, what if we didn't do X, Y, Z? And, um, and, you know, like things that Joel said too in the um, previously, I, I find very interesting about language and how it actually does shape the way we, we think and how we interact with the world. And, um, and, you know, just creating this new language um, for me is very exciting. So, um, and working with new me- mediums, but still introducing old and traditional ways of doing things. Like I find, you know, people of the past were just so very practical in the way they made things and how they interacted with things. and. Um, and that's where I think minimalism can come in um, into our everyday lives. It's where we really think about t- our time and quality and versus quantity. And um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be in how something looks or how um, it behaves, but in how much of it we have around us. So, mm-hmm. um, so it's those are the things that I. I um, I find inspiring and you know it's like how do you make something new in 2023 yeah absolutely Mm -hmm. um so we're getting kind of tight for time so I'm just gonna have one more question before we have um the audience q and A. I was going to ask um what does being black and free mean to you hmm I've been thinking about that you know um you know, I've really, uh, like, there's the project Black and Free, and then there's the statement Black and Free, you know, and, um, but it just means, it, it, it really means, for me, uh, you know, living in this culture, and um, being from Jamaica, where a Black person is, like, the, you know, the, the, this mainly, it's a predominantly Black population. So being Black and free in that context is very different from, in that environment is very different from, you know, being um, here in Canada. And I just think it really means that you can live your culture and be who you are and be comfortable in whatever that, com- whatever form or shape that is. And really, um, really standing in your truth you know and for me personally it's you know being an artist it's just such like one of the purest forms of expressing myself as a person and being able to do that and and um having the space to do that and projects like this i find um does provide that space of having this conversation and and inviting people to look at um, life and things just in a, in a different way or just see it the way you might, you see it just for 
a, a moment and you know just to to open someone's mind you know by having another perspective like from the my lived um, experience so yeah great answer thank you so much and thank you for answering my questions um so we'll now open the floor to some audience questions okay um Now you last question. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm so excited exactly that you are working on this and uh, grateful for your thoughtfulness and care. And I'm curious about process. You mentioned if you could talk a little bit about how you actually came to um, the digital images that you shared with us, uh, the actual tactile making process, please. I have so many questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it, I, it start, I started by hand and just really sketching um, and um, repeating these patterns and you know, doing the rotating, rotating of the different symbols and, and the silhouettes that we see from the kente cloth and um, just, you know, reducing that and like taking things away that um, wouldn't necessarily be relevant within creating the, the typeface and um, just lots of sketches by hand and then bringing it you know, and then digitizing that and then creating these, you know, high level sketches that we're seeing now. Because for me, there's still um, sketches because I can see where I need to like, this needs to be refined. And, um, but it's just really deconstructing um, the patterns within the Kente cloth um, was a big part of it. And um, seeing, you know, like the foundation, it's like architecture. It's like the foundation is the most important part and then you can build whatever structure that you need to build on top of that. But I just wanted to really start with this very strong foundation um, and something really bold and something that's um, definitely very um, hard to miss when, when you look at it. Can you talk about the choice to sketch first by hand as opposed to sketching digitally, like in, ter in terms of your own practice? I still, because I'm a painter, I still have this, like, I still have, you know, like an attachment to my paintbrushes and how energy flows through like my body and through the brush and, and how it feels to put like ink on, um, on paper. And um, so I still find so much pleasure in doing work in a very, you know, manual way. Um, so to be selfish about it, it feels really amazing when I'm <laughs> working by hand. And um, so that's why I, I wanted to start that way. And furthermore, like these were all done by hand to begin with, it was all to somewhat recreate a part of that process and how they made it. Um, so that's, you know, that's also another reason why I started um, doing the work manually that way. Yeah. Is that how you approach all of your work? Or are there some works where you'll go right to the digital? Most of my work is, um, you know, I'll just sketch or I'll, you know, just I'll do a sketch and then I'll do like ink, um, a lot of inking. Um, a few things, very few things I have actually started digital first, but mm -hmm. it's still the same process of me sketching on my iPad. So it still has the same, you know, similarities with it. Um, but a lot of times I just love the, the, the hand, you know, like I love the fact that it's handmade uh, and it can be handmade using your, your, you know, your, your mouse and your P Apple pencil and all of these things. But for me, it's just 
a process of like having that energy flow. It's just, um, it's really a part of my process that I've always loved since I was a child. And I really do like the slight imperfections that you may get when you're doing something um, physical that you may not get, or it's easy to replace or undo or erase when I have it, you know, like, on my if I'm, uh, for sometimes, even if I'm thinking about uh, photo shoots, sometimes I'll just sketch, like, where I'd want everyone to be, and just so that it's somehow, like, it also, it's a part of just me um, re retaining the information, and, and how I can, you know, make sure that I, I get this part done, because this is what's really important for this specific project. So um, it's, it's a big part of my process for sure. And then just the last process question. I didn't talk process all the time. Just curious to you then, once it's digital, like, will you pull it back and go back to sketching? Like, will you work it out, work any of it out by sketching by hand again? Or now that you've transferred it in this way, is that the new place where the work evolves? Um, no, because even with what I'm doing now, um, I want to print it off and like go back into it and work on it that way. Cause even if you think about like, cause modern typography, like font making or, um, to make a typeface, um, and for all the nerds out there, yes, I know there's a difference between a font and a typeface, but now it's pretty much interchangeable. So like, I'm just oh, going to use it that way. I don't way. know the, I don't the know font the difference is like the software. Way. The font is like the software the and then the typeface is like what you see, the, the imagery and, but people, it's just, into, we use both of it now, but before, like for the nerds, it, it, it's very different. Um, but if you think about it, it's the first type of type text on, on, on paper was done um, using, um, you would cut the, the, the type out and then you do like a block print, which is what people still do with textiles now. It's like really big in, in West Africa and in India, like block printing. So you'd have wood and then they would carve the um, letter out and the words out and, and then they would use that. And that's why black is such an important color, especially for type making type because you can easily see the type, um, the imperfections within it so that you can make your corrections. So a lot of times people would start out making blocks and then they would gradually lead up and um, um, to make the repetition with the, what we now know as like lithographic printing or um, digital printing is based off of that too. So it was all very manual and very all hand done. And even with screen printing, you would like have, you know, a thin sheet of, um, vellum and then you would cut the words out in that and then you would like push the ink through it and then you'd be able to see the words but it's it was very um uh, manual and it also kind of has this very lettering quality to it so lettering is when you draw a type or um when you make a, a letter from a drawing so you just draw it so it's very much an individual very unique um uh, type that you would be seeing that is it's just each time someone has to do it they would have to do it from scratch all over again so for me it's also introducing that kind of quality and element within um making the typeface where it's um it has some of these handmade qualities within it and um yeah, so it's it's a whole bunch of different things. So that's what I'm saying. It's like, you know, once you you interact with something and um, you're inspired by something, it stays with you. Well, it stays with me. And, you know, I take little pieces of things and like pull it together and then to make um, whatever it is that I'm working on. And, and you know, and that's why I found um, the mood board. It was just... Um, it was just, you know, such a great um, inspiration board because a lot of what was there, it, I do also find very inspiring. Yeah. Well, I would be remiss if I didn't take a moment to really thank Joel um, for his 
the just the deep partnership um, with Studio Otherness, the thoughtfulness, the early engagement, um, uh, deep like l so much learning as well. Like just learned so much, and I am learning so much through um, our partnership um, and deep listening too. Like I've just felt really heard and supported along the way. Um, so much gratitude for that too, Joel. Um, Joel, I'm glad that you've been brought down to the to the stage because <laughs> our our question is for both you and Tafui. Um, we have a question that says, "Can you talk more about the colonization and top uh, typeface design? How has Studio Otherness and your work, Tafui, counter the tradition?" So I think they're talking about gearing away from traditional. I'm gonna throw this to Joel because I I know he has lots of <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there's always the parameters of asking, okay, what can design do and what can design students do as uh, kind of all actors in a capitalist situation. Um, so on our side, um, this project is a, a very nice step forward in kind of acknowledging those goals. Um, this is one of several projects, um, Black and Free is a major one of them. Um, our studio over the last year has given about $40,000 worth of design work to uh, self-funded queer and uh, people of color uh, initiatives. Um, and so this is one small piece of that. Um, so uh, that's kind of part of it. What are we doing to dismantle things? I always believe that structural change is the best way to do that. Um, and you can do that through inspiration, but also just through um, putting the right people in the right room at the right time, which is what's happened on this project here. Um, our job was really to kind of facilitate the meeting of the minds, which is Naila and Tafui, and then getting out of the way. <laughs> um, so I hope that answers the question from our perspective. Um, if you're interested in discussions on uh, colonization, colonization in Canada, um, or colonization in design, uh, Ruben Pater, uh, who is a Dutch writer, has a lot of really great work on the politics of design. Um, that's a good entry point into a lot of the discussions in, say, that industrial sphere. So I hope, again, that answers the question. You know, just to add to it um you know i came here from jamaica and i i went to school in montreal and um you know going through the design um education system you could actually see how um colonialism has definitely played a part within the arts and design in particular um you know i remember i had one professor who said you know your culture places too much of an emphasis on your work. And like, I remember at the time being very hurt about it and um, crying and talking to friends and then thinking, but, but art and design is culture. Like how can, how, like how can culture not be a part of it? Cause it is, that's what it is. But it was just because at, I was, at, at that moment is when I started to try to figure out how could I include textiles within design, you know, and this is like, you know, 20 years ago. And um, it just seems so off because, you know, at the at putting something that's so, so tactile and into a world that that's filled with perfection. And that's why, you know, this project, you know, it's, it, it's, decades later but now it it's just proving the point that it's it's important to um include culture because there it is like helvetica is a part of of swiss culture and it it's it's like inspired so many other cultures um and people people have always used this as the the, the standard of beauty and um, and because it doesn't have, um, because it's not associated with a person or a face or an, an, an 
you know, an, a visual aesthetic that's on a human, people don't realize that it's still a part of, of um, colonialism and that it does affect um, how we see each other and what we think of something that doesn't look like it. So um, this is a very good investigation into art and design and particularly design um, and um, with this project with, um, with colonialism and how that's impacted other people and other cultures. If, if I could jump in, I also yeah. want to say that like, um, as a Canadian who left Canada for similar reasons, um, the culture of design in Canada is very much an institution. It is an institution that loves that minimalism, that modernism, things like this. So I think um, just by us subverting that typographic space um, on the land that we currently call Canada um, is um, an excellent first step, right? Um, we're quite radical <laughs> uh, to, to, to some people I know who would kind of have the monocle fly off type of stuff right now. So, um, this and you know, even to say that, to include, to like add to that thread that people tend to associate modernism and minimalism with Europe when it really didn't begin there. If you, that's why, that's also another reason why I started to investigate like pre-colonial indigenous um, work because that's where mo like that is the birth of minimalism if you don't have a pillow if you don't have you know down and and thread and a loom and all of these things what do you create and how do you get comfortable and how do you use the small amount of things that you have access to to make yourself look look good feel good and and operate within society. And that's really the birth of minimalism. It, it was already there. So to you know, take claim and, and hold on to it and say this is where it was born, it's you know, it's just not accurate. So that too, it's um, it's something that you, you know, I discovered just through digging. So yes. Wonderful. I just well, thank you both. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Neva. <laughs> I'll quickly say it speaks to the um, invisibility of, uh, well, the professor who taught it to me is Dr. Leslie Sanders, who's a critical scholar in Black studies in Canada um, and has been instrumental in um, mentoring so many Black studies scholars. Um, she talked about the invisibility of whiteness uh, or that way in which it can sit in um, as normal, as invisible, where Helvetica is deeply imbued with culture um, and perspective and politics, um, but that gets to pass as being unnamed, uh, and then everything else is judged in, in relation to, right? So yeah, just, uh, yeah, I think it's um, helpful to think about how that is so true in so many ways, and you both really have illuminated um, the ways in which that's present in, in, within design. Great. Thank you so much for your answers and thank you for your insights, Naila, as well. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, I did want to just ask uh, Tafui and Joel if you all could shout yourselves out where folks can find you online and if you have any future projects that you should keep an eye out for before we go. We could go, Joel. Thank you. You're so kind. Um, otherness.ca is the website. Um, and I would say if you want to watch anything, uh, please do check out nor.design, N-O-R, uh, Nancy October Robert .design. Um, We recently launched it as the first grassroots uh, commons and collective of Canadian design. It is a not-for-profit co-op. Um, that's our next biggest project or my next biggest project with a few other business partners. So in continuing to challenge narratives and design and things like that. Really funny. Thank you. Yay! That's amazing. That's really amazing. And uh, you can find me um, at shop, S H O P Tafui.com. That's my website and uh, my online store. And I'm also on Instagram. Um, I'm currently working on this project. Um, 
and we'll be doing some work in augmented reality during the summer. I also have a solo show that um, is in North Vancouver, currently up, and it's the investigation or of um, cornrows. So it's inspired by cornrows and the history of cornrows, and that's um, all done um, creating symbols in textiles. And um, that's up now in um, Seymour Gallery in Deep Cove, North Vancouver. And yeah, and then I have this project and my augmented reality work that I'm doing later on this summer. Amazing, thank you both so much. And thank you to the audience for being here. Um, and again, this is our last, our last one for the year. Um, so thank you for everyone who's been um, showing up and who's been asking questions and really engaged and to all of our artists um, in addition to our lovely guests today. Thank you. Great. Take care. Have a good night. Bye. Bye.